Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. My good friend Juna is at a din- dinner party and he's in charge of desserts, serving them. And He's a little bit of an iconoclast. So he's dishing out the pie and he goes around the table and slices it up, starts to hand it out. And first one is, okay, Bob, you get pie. Mary, you get pie. Oh, wait, running up. Now, Bob, you get pie. Mary, you get no pie. No way, that's not right. Mary, you get the pie. Bob, you get no pie. And then he comes to think of it and says, geez, if nobody, if not everybody can get pie, then nobody get pie. The dinner is ruined. And he wonders why he sees all these dinner dinner invitations go out and he never gets any. It's always, don't invite Nagarjuna. He is such a buzzkill. So <clears throat> the, uh, the three Dharma seals are, are impermanence, no self and uh, dissatisfaction, AKA suffering. And I think it's pretty easy to wrap our heads around impermanence. Um, Hasn't happened recently, but there have been quite a number of times when uh, my wrist malas have decided to go impermanent on me and spew beads all over the floor. So that one's pretty easy to wrap our heads around. And, you know, we have that bad day at work or whatever. And yeah, dissatisfaction, that's pretty easy to wrap our head around. But the no self part, that's where it gets tricky. Who is it that wants the pie? Can we answer that question? Well, I do. I'm hungry, I want pie, I like pie. Pie's great, give me a damn piece of pie. Make me one with pie. And I don't mean 3.1416, et cetera. Blueberries, crust, I want to be one with that. And of course, in reality, you already are one with the pie. It's just that you're still acting like a hungry ghost because the pie is not inside your stomach. So, the Hwadu, who wants pie, comes into play. Goes into that, that whole no self dilemma, or in some cases, tetralemma, that we sometimes feel when we want to put that division between us and somebody else when it's really not there. We hear we're one with everything. And since we're one with everything, technically that should, in theory, make dissatisfaction not a problem. Impermanence not a problem because we're with this in one form and we're with this in another form. We're both with the wood and the ash. No differentiation, no dividing line, no dualism. But We don't really experience our day-to-day existence like that so much. We can, 
if we choose to, if we want to think about things in terms of non-duality, we certainly can. And there are times when being dualistic in terms of the relative me and the relative you and who shows up at whose job and all that, that's okay. But the bottom line is that for as much I go to my job and you go to your job, there's also the no one is going to any job. Everyone is going to every job. Unification of all phenomena. Unimpeded. One phenomena penetrates another. But practically speaking, the way we experience our day-to-day -day life, it's hard to keep the non-duality in mind. How do we apply that from moment to moment to moment? Big question. Can we train ourselves or will ourselves into doing that? Possibly with enough practice and, and enough correct guidance, uh, we can certainly become more acclimated to that, whether it comes through 100% of the time is something else, but uh, we can get closer. We can use the don't know mind where rather than trying to separate things, consciously, conceptually dividing this because this is this and that is that, and I have a reason for this being this and that being that, we can just put that down. We can rely on don't know. What is this? Is it that? Or is it only this? Does it last forever? Or is it going to crumble immediately? Does it make you happy? Does it make you sad? Who is it that's asking the question? Who is it that's setting up all these different conceptual divisions? Don't know. Don't know, don't know. From moment to moment to moment, don't know. Zen is sometimes very difficult for people who don't work with a teacher or have a sangha or some situation in which they can immerse themselves and find themselves in the midst of the teachings. There's plenty of books that you can read about Zen. There's plenty of social media sites and uh, pundits that you can find about Zen. Uh, and by and large, my experience is that very few of them actually get to the point of the, yeah, we're all in this together uh, state, and it's mostly I'm Zenier than you. But uh, hopefully in a Sangha or with a teacher, that's not the experience. You have somebody that will guide you and um, allow themselves to be guided in return. When we get attached to this 
I, 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 me, 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 mine, 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 mine. That's when we start getting into problems. The Diamond Sutra talks about all beings are no beings, thus are they called beings. If you don't have a teacher or some sort of sangha or sounding board to explain what's meant by that, um, that could sound a lot like gibberish. Because we do this fairly regularly, we, we know what the implication of that is. That, yeah, conventionally there's being. In reality, in the absolute, there's no being. But for convenience sake, we'll call them beings. If you only read that out of a Diamond Sutra text, um, you know, what are you, high? seems like a potentially appropriate response. Um, aside from the attachment to the idea of a permanent self, there's also sensual attachments. I like this, it makes me feel good. That blueberry pie is mighty tasty. It's attachments to opinions, of course, which we're all very familiar with, especially these days. There's attachment to rites and rituals, and that can be everything from um, if I don't like the candles before starting, then my day is entirely thrown off and we can't have the service and I'm gonna sit here and pout. Or coming home from work at six o'clock, hey, why isn't dinner on the table already? That's a ritual in and of itself. The big one, is the attachment to the idea of self. Because when we're attached to the idea of a self, and mind you, I'm calling it the idea of a self, that's when we start to create all these divisions and put walls up around ourselves and exclude other people from coming in and exclude us from leaving, from departing on the other side of our walls, where we can actually be of some sort of service to our fellow sentient beings. So um, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? We can try, 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 try to manifest some sort of loving kindness and compassion at all times to all beings. And hopefully if we try, 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 then we'll succeed at some point, at least part of the time. And that'll be better than not doing anything. The Buddha said that among the things that cause us problems are the fact that we like the things we like and we don't like the things that we don't like and we like the people we like and we don't like being apart from the people we like. I, 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 me, 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 my, 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 my. I want it, I wanna be with you. And as noble as it sounds, it's an attachment. It's an attachment to this 
idea of a self. So we can get so attached to these things that when we try and let go of them, it becomes really difficult. Like when I first started uh, in a meditation group, it was uh, Soto. And then through just random occurrences and happenstances of geography and, and no great search or anything like that, it just ended up that um, I ended up with the original mind in Princeton. And Andre Tyson Hallo was the priest there and, and the guiding teacher. And so I fell in with this whole five mountain order thing. But there were some differences. When I was sitting with the Soto group, we faced the wall, period. We didn't do koans, we sat and we faced the wall. And while I was doing it, that's what I thought Zen was all about. To coin a phrase, just sitting. And then I joined these guys in a Korean lineage. And they're not facing the wall, they're actually facing forward. And they're walking around the room doing walking meditation the wrong direction. And some other things that we did that seemed contrary to everything I had held dear when practicing Soto. But anyway, it was like, okay, so what's the end game for Soto? Find true nature, help all beings, realize awakening, okay? What's the end game for this song group? True nature, help all beings, realize awakening. Hmm. So maybe that whole sort of means thing wasn't too important and the end was. So it was a matter of, you know, just putting it down. From moment to moment to moment sometimes, put it down, put it down, put it down. Every time I would think that these son guys were a bunch of heretics, I was like, okay, put it down, put it down, put it down. And attachments are one of the major, 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 major hindrances to awakening. And we can know that. We can know that this idea of a separate self and deny impermanence and say it's all good when it's not all good. And we can say those things and believe them and hang on to them. And it really makes things difficult because I think deep down we know that's really not how things are, but damn it, it's a lot easier. So sometimes we find ourselves in a position where these mechanisms that we've been using to get along like the idea of a separate self, like the idea of everything has a permanent nature. When all those things that had helped us get along all that while are suddenly not working anymore, it's time that we put down the attachment to them. Now granted, sometimes we're gonna leave claw marks when we do but relinquishing the attachments, putting them down is only going to help us realize our true nature, help all beings and realize awakening.